joining us as we kick off the first of six virtual training events in our Building Inclusive and Equitable Workplaces training series. My name is Sandy Piotz, Site Leader for Microsoft and Chair of the Fargo-Moorhead West Fargo Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors. In mid-August of this year, the Chamber's Board of Directors approved a statement outlining our commitment, continued commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Your chamber stands firm in supporting diverse, equitable, and inclusive workplaces and communities, and that differences should be celebrated. In addition, we believe that teams with diverse experiences and backgrounds will succeed. To make real progress, we must look at ourselves and work together to make our region a better and more inclusive place, not only for business, but all facets of our lives. And we accept this responsibility. The Chamber's commitment to you is we will create environments in which we can lead meaningful discussions. We will offer education and information to all community members and employers. We will look for opportunities to listen, to learn, and continue to educate ourselves on these issues. And we will seek partnerships to create sustainable strategies and solutions to drive growth and prosperity for all. As you and your organization proceed down the path of becoming more diverse, inclusive, and equitable, we challenge you to share with us and our community the work that you are doing. We want to hear your successes and support your efforts. The strength of our region is on all of us, and together we can create a better future. Again, thank you for joining us as we kick off the first installment of Building Inclusive and Equitable Workplaces. We are excited to learn alongside of you as we build even better workplaces where all individuals are welcome, invested in, and engaged in the work they find rewarding. Before we get started, just a couple of notes for the event series. As you're listening along, please feel free to utilize the question and answer tab or the discussion feature on the right side of the live stream. If you would like to ask your question anonymously, please feel free to enter anonymous into the required name box. Following today's event, the chamber team will distribute a post event survey as well as SHRAM and HRCA codes if you are seeking continuing education credits. They will also distribute the event recording for those of you who may wish to share today's webinar with a colleague or watch it again. Additionally, registration is still open for the upcoming series topics and we are happy to share the event recordings with anyone so that they can get caught up. Finally, your registration for today's event is good for all six of the sessions. The Chamber team will send out event reminders and the appropriate link as each upcoming session approaches. Please help me welcome our presenter, Kira Kimball. Kira serves as the Chief Innovation Officer for Marsh and McLennan Agency for Sioux Falls and Fargo. As a committed business leader in her community, Kira serves on the Board of Directors for Southeast Tech Foundation, Levitt at the Falls, the Sioux Falls Development Foundation, and 100 plus women who care of Sioux Falls. Kara is also the first person in both South and North Dakota to earn the National Diversity Council Certified Diversity Professional designation and is a qualified administrator of the Intercultural Development Inventory. Thank you, Kira, for serving as our presenter. I will now turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Sandy, for the very wonderful introduction. I can't tell you how excited I am to be with you here this morning. And I greet you from my kitchen table in Southwest Sioux Falls on a beautiful fall day. However, I so wish that we could be together in the Fargo-Moorhead West Fargo community to celebrate the kickoff of this event series. My understanding is that there are nearly 300 of you who've registered and what a wonderful opportunity to come together as a community and to really declare commitment uh, to creating diverse, equitable, and inclusive workplaces. Again, my name is Kira Kimball, and I am part of Marsha McLennan Agency in the Sioux Falls and Fargo offices, and I'm delighted to partner and to provide some education around creating diverse, equitable, and inclusive workplaces. 
And we're going to start with the business case today about why DEI is an important strategy for your success as a business, whatever industry you might be, from banking, agriculture, construction, education, retail, nonprofit. This is an opportunity to differentiate and also to create greatness in your community. Today's presentation will be a little bit different than the others that we will be kicking off uh, later in September through October and November. I'll be providing you with lots of statistics and lots of data really to arm you with the business case about making a decision to fully commit. But as we begin, I want to illuminate the pathway that we have together this fall for the series. And as Sandy indicated, registration is still open. So this is an opportunity to share with a colleague or a friend to invite them to participate in the, uh, the additional webinars that we will be having throughout the course of this autumn. Some of you may have already attended a similar webinar. If you are a, a client and a friend of Dawson Insurance MMA, you were invited over the course of the summer to attend our Pathways, which is a Sioux Falls community coalition around inclusive and equitable workplaces where we did a, a seminar series such as this one. So if you're coming for the second time, we're really glad to have you here. And my colleague Ben Zietz in the Fargo Dawson MMA office is really working on putting together a community coalition uh, for the FM. So if you have interest in that, you will definitely want to reach out to Ben or to me. So today's learning outcomes and the objectives that I hope you will take away today, here they are. Changes in demographics and buying power, and as businesses, why we should be paying attention to these. Secondly, attitudes of job seekers regarding a diverse workplace. The reality is individuals who are out in the marketplace looking for an employer are valuing diversity. Third, the business outcomes or return on investment for employers who commit to having diverse workplaces. And then finally, my hour with you today is really about giving you, whether you're the decision maker, whether you're an employee, a manager, a community member, all the information that you might need to go to your board or to your CEO to say, there is a business case for doing this work of diversity in our workplaces. And as Sandy indicated, SHRM credit and HRCI credit for continuing education for HR professionals will be available. As we kick this off, let's think about this series as a whole and how I really will be talking about diversity throughout the next few months together. Really right now, what we've seen in our communities due to the elevated attention around race and civil unrest, often individuals think about race and ethnicity as the conversation that revolves around diversity. The reality is diversity is so much bigger. And if I hearken back to Sandy's words just moments ago, I heard her talk about creating work environments and cultures where we are creating safety for all of us to show up wholly as who we are. And that is a great community vision as business and industry. And that really equals exactly what I'll be talking about in terms of diversity. So you can see this honeycomb here that looks at many different ways to view difference in the workplace, whether it's religion and spiritual beliefs, gender identity, age, education, geography, socioeconomic status, country of origin, all of those intersections of the complexities of diversity make up who we are. So really throughout the series, you'll hear me talk about diversity through a, a very large lens. But for the purpose of today's discussion and really looking at the business case and giving you tools to be able to express that there is great value and return for businesses, you're going to hear me talk and focus a lot today on race, gender, 
and age. There will be some other conversations about other parts of diversity on the spectrum, but this will really be my focus point. And the reality is that there's research out there that points to the value of employers committing to diverse workplaces and the differentiator that it brings to you. So I'm gonna bring that data to you today. And again, this will all be recorded and freely shared with you. This content, we want you to share widely because it is so important. Uh, so feel empowered when you get this information to have conversations with your, not only your colleagues, but your network and your community as a whole. So let's start off first with demographics. And when we think historically of who our workers have been, who our workforce who are vendors, who are clients, consumers, customers, however you might define as a business um, to engage with the community. And really think about these demographics in terms of shifting and how the shift in these demographics will hopefully empower you to think differently about how you do business and with whom you do business. So again, there's going to be a lot of data and numbers and statistics. And if that is not your bailiwick, I know you can stick with me for this, for this hour because you will be empowered by them. So I'm gonna jump right into them. The reality is 50% of children under five are minorities. 20% of these individuals have a foreign born parent. And as a community that is a refugee settlement and a state, South Dakota is as well, we know that as business leaders and community members, it's really important for us to pay attention to the statistic. Because when we think of workforce development opportunities, if you look into the green box following, one in four youth is from an immigrant family. These individuals will become our, for our future workforce. They will be the individuals who we go and, and present a junior achievement um, capsules to. They will come to our shadowing experiences or our internship fairs. So it's important for our workplaces to have a, a level of readiness for this diversity. And when we think about workforce development is, the reality is, if not for new minorities, our workforce would be declining by 8% across the country. And I know in North Dakota, South Dakota, the upper Midwest as a whole, and really throughout the country, workforce development is a huge issue. And I know your chamber, and I know uh, fueling our future um, for your community is, is paying attention to this and is working on this. Also, between 2010 and 2030, the workforce will decrease by 15 million white people and gain 26 million minorities. Again, the faces of our workplace, especially leadership and uh, community boards or business boards will have the opportunity to shift in terms of how we show up and what we look like. And in fact, to fill those positions of innovation, growing markets and other opportunities, we will as business leaders need to think differently about how we cast our net to fill positions. Millennials are 50% of the workforce, and in 2025 will be 75%. So age diversity is incredibly important for us to think of, with five generations often found in many businesses, being able to navigate differences through age in that worldview is critical for our success. Baby boomers, baby boomers right now are 75% white and many baby boomers are in that retirement age. And so as business leaders are creating their succession plans for opportunities for sustainability for their companies, it's going to be important for us to think differently about who fills those positions. While baby boomers are 75% white, millennials on the other hand are only 56% white. And in 2030, 54% of new minorities will be under 40 years old. So these individuals will really be the ones who are up and coming for opportunities for development and investment. And we, when we look at gender, right now women are 51% of the population and 47% of the workforce. 
And when I was talking with a, a, a client partner who lives in Georgia yesterday, he was sharing with me that this is an opportunity for his firm as many of his leaders and his organization and on his business board uh, really are men. So a lot of individuals are leaning into diversity, again, from a race, ethnicity perspective, gender and age. I did a little search the other day on the Fargo public school system and the Moorhead public school system. I know this graphic is hard for you all to see, but if you scroll your eyes over to the third from the right column, you will see at the bottom 30% of your school age children in the Fargo Moorhead West Fargo area. Well, for Fargo specifically 30%, almost a third um, are underrepresented or minority individuals. The Moorhead Public Schools, they didn't have the same graph, but they did publish 24% of their children come from a minority background. So let's think about this. Think about back to when you were a kid. And I remember in fourth grade when we did our first kind of career exploration. And when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to be for myself, Think about all these children throughout your school districts. And, and some of you might be educators or um, of course no educators. Those children um, who are from minority backgrounds, underrepresented communities, they are looking um, outside to see what careers are there for me? What can I grow up to be? What is my opportunity um, to, to have career well-being and thrive? And right now in our communities in the upper Midwest, we know that a lot of minority children are not seeing themselves expressed in multiple industries, let alone at leadership levels. So it's really important for businesses to consider the, the outcomes of not changing our makeup, because at some point these children will grow up. Um, they may go on to education at higher ed, they may enter the workforce right away. And if they're not seeing themselves or they're not experiencing environments where they feel they can show up as who they are in a safe place and feel valued and be invested in, uh, there's a great opportunity for them to leave our communities. We call that brain drain. Um, when a, a, an individual who's ready to enter the workforce decides this is not the place for me, I'm going to Minneapolis or to Omaha or to Denver or to Chicago or a bigger opportunity where I might feel that I fit in more. So I would really invite you to think about the children when you are out at, at Hornbachers, when you are, are, are going to the restaurants, um, to the mall, to downtown shops, and you are seeing your community, think of those kids. And is there an opportunity for us as businesses to really start doing differently so they can see themselves in different jobs? Right now, we see a lot of individuals maybe working in an agribusiness. We might see them in hospitality as examples. And we want to make sure that career paths, those who really believe in equitable and inclusive workplaces, are open to all people. So those demographics really go hand in hand in changes in buying power. So when you think about who your target customer is, your client, your consumer, um, how you create and market products, services, intellectual property, whatever that might be. Because there is such great changes in buying power from underrepresented individuals and, and um, communities throughout the country, as business leaders, it's really important for us to lean into this from a market share perspective, if you will. So let's take a look. Hispanic Americans, they are growing in terms of their buying power from 1.3 trillion to 1.7 currently. Asian Americans also in the last five years have grown about uh, $4 um, billion in, in terms of their buying power as consumers. African Americans or black individuals also growing in that buying power. We would include indigenous people, uh, native communities, which certainly the upper Midwest um, has, has the honor of celebrating a lot of those customs and traditions and those individuals, uh, their buying power is growing. The LGBTQ plus community, 
often isn't looked at as a community that has buying power. These dollars are pretty impressive uh, throughout the United States, $3.7 trillion. And I think of downtown Sioux Falls and maybe downtown Fargo as well, where there are examples of the rainbow flag, which is typically associated with the LGBTQ plus community and businesses who, um, who are partners, allies, part of the LGBTQ plus community, when they wave that flag, that's a communication signal to these community members to know that this is a business that values you as people and welcomes you into this business. And when we think of referrals, some of you may look at net promoter scores, your, your clients, customers um, making referrals to your organization because of who you are and, and, and the kind of business you run and your customer service, whatever that might be. It's helpful to think of uh, these individuals on the screen as an opportunity to connect with them and to know that when you develop focus groups or marketing campaigns or product testing, um, you, you know, even we think of during COVID-19, many businesses, and I'm thinking of our, our friends in downtown Fargo who have had um, shops have gone online a lot during COVID-19 and their power to attract uh, geography becomes a non-issue now. And they're reaching out across the country, across the globe, and individuals of difference might be shopping there. So we want to make sure that we're considering connecting with diverse communities about product development uh, because they have a lot of dollars to spend. And I think about um, our, our larger organizations. I think about our healthcare organizations as an example and that there are dollars to be spent in, in healthcare communities or where I will go to do my banking as an example or how I will spend um, my discretionary dollars for entertainment. Thinking about um, diverse populations is important. Individuals with disabilities also buying power here is incredible with them. And the reality is 1 million immigrants spend $2 trillion in the US annually, coming from completely different countries, having different customs, beliefs, values, religions, and being prepared for that diversity can be very critical for our success. Our millennials and women are also are really advancing in their ability to take market share. When we look at women just alone in the bottom right-hand corner, $4.3 trillion of $5.9 trillion being spent out in the economy is spent by women. And that's pretty impressive. So these changes in buying power hopefully illuminate for you to think about your customer base um, or the services that you offer in a much bigger way to be able to tell your story. Let's look a little bit more specifically at North Dakota. And then I also have some South Dakota data as well. And I want you to also think just anecdotally from your own experiences out in your community. You know, I've lived in Sioux Falls for 18 years and I have definitely witnessed changes in different communities um, being, being part and interacting with business and nonprofits and services, you name it. But when we look at this data from the Selig Center of Economic Multicultural Econo Economy Report, um, which is studied outside of the University of Georgia, we see that South Dakota and North Dakota rank among the top 10 states where the largest growth in minority buying power has taken place. And you know, my experience again in Sioux Falls, and you know, I come to Fargo as well. I um, am an alumna of Minnesota State University Moorhead, and I absolutely love visiting. I've seen great changes in both of our communities. And when you look at these statistics, you know, granted, when it's a smaller percentage um, from the beginning in 2000, uh, the large percentages are really going to happen, and we're going to see dramatic changes from the beginning. But in North Dakota, African Americans, a 1,000% increase over the last 20 years. Hispanic Americans, over 600%. And Asian Americans, nearly 500%. So these individuals, you know, in terms of the changes in demographics and coming to our communities, 
Um, businesses thinking about market share is a great opportunity. Let's talk now about the diversity dividend. Certainly many of you are showing up today and I heard this in Sandy's um, prelude comments about the chamber's vision and, and the opportunity to transform community. Many of you are showing up with the heart case around this and that you're thinking about your neighbors, you're thinking about children, and you're really thinking about the opportunity to create a flourishing and prosperous community for all. And that's important. And I lead with that as well as a diversity, equity, and inclusion educator and as a community member. But the reality is uh, there's definitely a diversity dividend for those organizations who really decide to lean in and commit to these changes. And oftentimes when we're at the starting gate and when businesses talk, talk with me about changing the leadership, changing who they invest in, thinking about their board positions, they always say to me, but you know, Kira, I, I don't wanna set a goal. I don't wanna have a quota. That just feels very inauthentic. And I want you all to hear today that I agree with that, that setting quotas, um, we all want to hire the best person. And that's truth to this. And that's very important for us to recognize. But what I will be ex hopefully um, inspiring you to think about throughout the series is really starting to cast your net differently and wider when you get down to recruitment. And that this isn't about optics and filling a position. This is about getting the best candidate for any position. But the reality is there are many wonderful candidates that come from incredibly diverse backgrounds. So we'll get to that as we move along the series. But I just want everyone to hear this isn't about quotas. This is about creating a richer environment based on diversity that is going to bring value to you as a business owner. So companies in the top 25% for racial and ethnic diversity are 30% more likely to have financial returns above national mediums within their industry. So when you think about as a manufacturer, as an example, and you think about where the median is for your return on investment, for your revenue, however you might define dividend, Companies who are more diverse tend to have a greater chance for higher revenue for their organization, 30% in fact. So that's really some of the business case right there for thinking differently from a racial and ethnic perspective. Companies in the top 25%, now we're talking about gender, for gender diversity are 15% more likely to have financial returns above their industry's national median. That's an exciting opportunity. Again, when you think about the bottom line and you think about writing your budget and your returns and going to your board, these are compelling statistics in terms of thinking differently about um, the makeup of your workforce. Conversely, in the yellow box, Companies in the bottom 25%, both for gender and racial ethnic diversity, are less likely to achieve above average returns. So again, the flip side of this, when we all look alike, when we all are alike, I think of myself, I'm 50 years old, I'm a white woman, there's other parts of my diversity as well. But if I had a conference room table of my executive leaders around um, my strategy making, development opportunities, whatever that might be. If everyone is like me, there's not a lot of diversity of thought, is there? Probably not diversity of leadership or style. We're all coming at problem solving from the, the, the Kira Kimball perspective, which really is going to have some blind spots or eclipse some opportunities. And that's what that yellow box is really highlighting for us. Not only that, but the reality is the diversity of our workforce allows us to have other opportunities for consumers. And we talked about that with the buying power. 
But when you think about bringing in one of your colleagues to work on a project with an organization or work with a customer or um, um, a prospect, again, using language that makes sense for you, a vendor relationship, a collaboration, having individuals who might be able to reflect that partner and make that connection can be a good opportunity for us. And, you know, as an organization that works with clients and considers them partners, we know that we want to get the best people connected to make the biggest impact for our clients. And my hunch is you do as well as an organization. So thinking about that from a business development perspective, a vendor partner relationship perspective, and really stickiness um, with keeping your partners, your clients, your consumers, um, those net promoter scores, your customers coming back to you. Because if not, we can see that companies will show up in the bottom. And the reality is organizations with above average diversity have 19% higher innovation revenues and 9% higher margins. And again, that has a lot to the diversity of thought coming from problem solving, innovating, generating from different points of view. So that box is really speaking about uh, when a business wants to create something new, whether it's a different product, IP, um, go into a, a different market share, you name it, there's an opportunity for you to have a better return because of the diversity within your organization. Let's talk a little bit from the team perspective now. Executive teams, the teams that guide strategy, that guide vision, and are also the ones who promote, develop, and invest in team members. When executive teams that have racial and ethnic diversity, are 30, they are 33% more likely to outperform others on profitability. That's a third percent better chance to outperform. And executive teams that have gender diversity are 21% more likely to outperform on profitability. And this, these opportunities are really about changing the makeup of our teams and who they are and what they look like. Diverse management teams had a 19% increase in revenue than less diverse teams. So the, the and finally, diverse teams are 87% better at making decisions. And again, going back to my example of a bunch of curas around the table problem solving, having some diversity of thought is going to make a difference maker when you're trying to outperform your competitors in the marketplace. There's really good data out there from the McKinsey report. Um, McKinsey is a great institute that focuses a lot on data around diversity. Deloitte does great work as well. And then certainly as a certified diversity professional with the National Diversity Council um, out, out of Houston, they have great statistics and data too. So you can really see uh, from, from the, those statistics that there is a real business case um, from opportunities to increase your revenue and your market share. So when we summarize all of this information, we really see that this is diversity for the win. We think about this from a workforce development perspective. Again, changes in those demographics. We know this from a buying power that our minority communities are definitely amassing um, more dollars to put into the economy and need to be listened to because of that. And then finally, the return on investment. So Deloitte tells us out of their interviews with 10,000 businesses, that because of, of some of these data, 78% of businesses say that committing to DEI in their workplaces really creates a competitive advantage for them. And hopefully by listening to this, you can see that opportunity, no matter the size of business, whether you're a large business with multiple locations across the country, or you are a smaller business downtown um, that has a handful of employees, that showing up as a diverse, equitable, and inclusive organization, a welcoming organization that allows all people to feel they can show up as who they are, this is going to be a difference maker. So in summary, we know that problem solving is elevated with a diverse team. 
having different experiences, you know, coming to the table. And I think of individuals, um, let's talk a bit again about our refugee and immigrant populations, our new Americans that end up in our communities because of us uh, resettlement into our um, country, North Dakota and South Dakota. Many of these individuals bring great experience from their countries. They may have been an economist, uh, a doctor, an engineer, an educator, oftentimes language and trauma um, can become barriers for these individuals to access meaningful work that we can transfer their skills and really get them working at their highest potential. So those employers who are starting to think differently about attracting immigrant refugee uh, talent who um, is, is going to show up differently than we are in many uh, different ways or than I am, they bring a wealth of experience. And I know Lutheran Social Services of North Dakota does amazing work um, with helping with, with entry uh, into our communities and workplaces and helping with language. And for those businesses who are really committed, there's great opportunity here um, to develop wonderful workforce. Style. And when I say style, I'm not, I'm not talking about how an individual dresses, um, but instead I'm talking about their personality. Uh, their leadership style. And when we, we move outside of race, ethnicity, gender, and age, and, and you know, maybe we talk a, a little bit about personality, that's important too. When I think about myself as an extrovert and we're, we're discussing something, you know, I'm quick to jump in and share my opinion, whereas some of my other colleagues who are introverted and processors, they may need a day or two. And it's really important that we allow for that diversity and bring them back because many of you out there, I'm sure are processors or introverts and have wonderful ideas. And we need to make sure again, that we're creating pathways for all of kinds of ways of interacting in the workplace and not just presuming that there's a better style of leadership um, or how we show up as an organization. Innovation, definitely with different ideas and backgrounds, we're gonna come at problem solving and creation in a very different way. And the, the diverse backgrounds, the diversity of thought, all of that is really going to position you as an organization uh, to have this be an edge for you out in the marketplace uh, for your um, workforce development perspective uh, talent that you wanna bring on, as well as taking on more market share. Let's talk a little bit about workforce expectations. And this is an area that I also lead in our, our Fargo and Sioux Falls operations for MMA is um, help with workforce talent development. I lead our internship program, um, which is an absolute blast. And my hunch is many of you have shadowing or internship experiences uh, for, for students as well. And right now, um, when we look at Gen Xers, millennials, and the Gen Z folks, they're really accounting for the majority of our workforce. And when we think of our baby boomers as an example, and again, it's really important for you not to hear any judgment when we say younger or older, these are really just descriptions about demographics and the reality of the world that we live in right now. And compared with older workers, um, these generations have different views often, not always, and expectations about work. And when we think of Gen Z, so many of them have grown up going to school um, with more diversity than I. I grew up in Huron, South Dakota in the 70s. And when I think of uh, diversity from a salient or observable future, feature, there wasn't a lot of that in, Sioux, in, in Huron or in Sioux Falls. When I now go back to my hometown, which is about, a, oh, I don't know, 10,000 or so, there's a great deal of diversity. And a lot of that had to do with refugee resettlement. And so a lot of kids growing up in our communities, I'm using Huron as an example, Sioux Falls, Fargo, they're seeing diversity in their, in, in their classes and students on college campuses because colleges are recruiting a more holistically, more international students are coming to our campuses they are used to and value a diverse population. So when they are going out 
into the marketplace and they're thinking about where they want to work. In fact, when I interview interns, one of the questions that they talk about is, you know, tell me a little bit about your diversity because over 86% of job seekers right now are saying that workforce diversity is an important factor when they're seeking for a job. It's a value that they are looking for. So when you think about your employer brand, and we'll talk a, a lot about that as, as we move down our series, this, this is, will be important for your employer brand and attracting those Gen Zs. And again, thinking of those kids in the Fargo-Moorhead, West Fargo school district growing up, that they are diverse people and um, that they are going to want to see organizations where they're reflected as well, because that's going to make them feel like they can succeed there, that they're not the only one. So what can we do now to really start thinking differently? So the reality is, and, and this is a quote from one of our sister companies, the CEO, Martine Furland. We need leaders who are aligned on the business value of diversity and inclusion so that it really flows throughout the organization, not as a mandate, but as a powerful component of culture, as a powerful component of culture. And today we know that creating a, a culture where employees feel engaged and empowered is critical for our success as businesses. My hunch is many of you might have a, a culture team or engagement team or a culture club or work site wellness where you have employees really come together to cast a vision for how we're going to create a positive culture. Because when each of us comes to work and we cross that threshold, although for many of us, it's very virtual, a virtual threshold right now, we definitely wanna feel like we're part of a great organization and an organization that cares about us um, beyond our job code or our job rank, our job description, but really looks at us as a human being. And diversity, equity, and inclusion is really an engagement strategy. I like to call it the next step practice for engagement. And there are, there are many organizations uh, right now uh, due to Black Lives Matter, COVID-19, the civil unrest that have, have uh, posted a lot of statements on their websites or um, on their LinkedIn pages indicating that diversity, equity, and inclusion is important to them. And there are so many individuals right now who are following companies and looking at websites who are seeing that but are wondering what's behind the statement. That whole concept again about um, does, does your video match your audio? Are you doing what you're saying you're doing? And the best practice for DE, DE and I is that it's not about optics, but it really is, as Martine says, creating this as part of your culture and how we show up as an organization. That it's not just a check the box because so many of us historically, and when we, when we think of those of us who've been in the workforce uh, for a long time, Diversity really um, is often seen as a compliance and that I need to make sure I am following the rules and regulations that I have set before me. And the new evolution of this practice is really looking at engagement. So as a recap, let's look at the benefits because some of you are, are leaning in right now. Many of you may already be doing some of these practices. I recognize that our audience today, uh, we're all on a journey and MMA as a whole, uh, Tom Dawson, who is your, your outgoing chair, uh, my, my colleague would indicate as well that we're stepping into this. We're about a year and a half into it, starting these new practices. And it is something that we need to commit to, but we realize that there's so much opportunity for us as an organization. And many of you might be on your journey as well. And, and some of you might be leaning in for the first time, you know, wondering what, what is this all about? And, and maybe you're inspired because of the events that have been happening over the course of the last six months. And you're saying, what can I do? How can I make a difference? And the wonderful thing is there's room for all of us that you know, this is a journey we can all be at different places. 
And the cool thing that the chamber is doing and fueling forward uh, by bringing us all together is now we're creating a community and that we can support one another. And hopefully you all will be, will be sharing and, and talking with each other so we can come alongside and do this work together because the benefits are uh, immeasurable for us. So in summary, this is a workforce development solution. When you're thinking about talent and attracting talent, uh, there's opportunities for us. Finding workforce is competitive right now. And we know individuals are, are leaving organizations for a dollar raise an hour or for mentoring opportunities, continuous learning, you name it. So for us as employers and business leaders, um, thinking differently about who we bring on, how we recruit, and our talent attraction strategy is huge. And we'll be talking about casting the net differently um, for more diverse talent. So this commitment to DE&I can help you with your talent. Secondly, it's an economic development opportunity. When you think about your own business and the buying power and the market share opportunities through these diverse communities and the dollars that they have available, it's a huge huge opportunity for you as a business, whatever type of industry you are. But the next thing, I would invite you uh, to think about Fargo, Moorhead, West Fargo as a whole. And when you think about what Fueling Forward's vision is, and I sit on the Sioux Falls Development Foundation, which we have Forward Sioux Falls, and I am on, on that board. And we, and much like the, the chamber and, and Fueling Our Future, are, are really about what are the economic development opportunities for our community. And when we think about committing to practices around DE&I and as a community showing up that we do this work, we have created inclusive and equitable workplaces. When you think about business development opportunities for fueling our future and the chamber and you know going to a California business and saying, you may want to consider relocating your headquarters here or uh, Boston organizations uh, planting one of your operations or your plant here, what, uh, bringing entrepreneurs, incubators, startups here. When you think about attracting businesses to put their flags in, in the FM area, being able to show up as a community that values inclusivity and equitability within our workforces is fabulous. And when you think about, um, um, let's talk about biotech or health sciences, lab sciences is an, ex is an example. And oftentimes recruiting those individuals takes us nationally or internationally for that very specific kind of talent. Oftentimes they may come from a diverse background. So what can we do as communities to really think about this as an economic development solution for our cities. Definitely talked about business betterment, that this improves our ability to problem solve, to attract talent, uh, to open up our opportunities to new markets and really retain talent um, and clients and customers along the way. If you hadn't heard about brain drain before, hopefully that was something that I either reinforced or introduced you to when kids grow up and they don't see an opportunity for them where, where either they grew up or where they went to school, um, whether it's high school or college, and they go someplace else where they think it's a better match for who they are as an individual or that um, there's a better opportunity for them. So creating organizations that look diverse and reflect our communities can really help with keeping our talent right here in our communities. Improving overall community well-being. Just as I you know, show up as someone who lives on Blue Stem Street and go out into the community, either as a participant or a consumer, knowing that my community values DE&I for all people uh, really creates more community safety, um, more access to opportunities for all people. And when we go back again to thinking about some individuals maybe find themselves in some careers, but that they don't necessarily find themselves in other careers or being developed and mentored to take those leadership roles in organizations or boards, there is a real opportunity for us uh, to transform our communities. 
So really, these are these are win 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 opportunities for us. Those dice there, I love them because there's not a lose on, on the side of it. But the reality is, this is this is some commitment. And when we come together as a as an organization, and and when I get calls all the time, uh, Kira, talk with me about how I start this work in my business. I really talk with them about commitment, and that this is something that can't sit over here in a silo, um, that it is not something a CEO or a business leader says, I give you permission to do this work. As executives and leaders, we need to be instrumentally involved in this activity and really creating resources, time, uh, capital, and strategy around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the quote again from Martine is that this isn't just a program or initiative that sits over here. The organizations that really commit to weaving diversity, equity, and inclusion to all parts of their business is really which has the great opportunity for some of the returns that you've seen. So with that, um, I, I, if you've got some questions, and I don't know if I can see them in, in chat, but as Sandy indicated at the beginning, they will be collected and I will be happy to engage those questions and answer them and work with the chamber to make sure you get answers to the questions. But just as a reminder, if you've registered for this webinar, you are registered for all five of them. So your access is good for the rest of the calendar. And to make sure you have that marked, I'll be back with you on September 24th to really begin talking about inclusive leadership and how we as leaders, uh, no matter our role or title, can really show up differently to create a better work environment for all people. The SHRM code and the HRCI code will be emailed out tomorrow. And you will also be getting access to a recording of this in the next few days or so. So make sure you're looking for an email from the chamber for those of you doing Sherman HRCI credit and then for the recording. And please feel free to share this widely. That's incredibly important. I am um, making sure I'm catching all my notes. Finally, um, please fill out the survey and give us some feedback on the content and maybe you might have some questions that you would ask there too. So with that, I am so grateful again to be your partner in this journey thus fall, and I'm incredibly excited for the commitment that we are seeing from, from the chamber and fueling our future. I mean, that is amazing to come together that way, and MMA Dawson is just elated to be your partner. So thank you for your time today, and I'll see you on September 24th.